only on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, my final hour filling in for Michael Pelka. Let's make it good, right? Um, We've been uh, we've been doing a lot of good news today, and a lot of uh, a lot of the good stuff happening in the world. And I think and I think we're we're wrapping up that discussion by discussing what leads to good stuff. What is the source of progress? What is the source of happiness? What is the source of success uh, in one's personal life and in an economy, in a culture, in a world? Where does the good stuff that we have around us come from? And uh, where does the bad stuff come from? And I have argued that the good, the good comes when we exercise our minds, when we use our reason, when we think before we act, when we embrace reason and thinking as our tools, as our means of cognition and our guides to action. And, you know, that doesn't mean ignoring your emotions. Emotions are great. Emotions are how we live our life, how we experience our life. You want to have your emotions ultimately aligned with your thinking. It sometimes takes time. All it means is you don't act on those emotions until you've thought it through. You know, unless you're in an emergency. Put aside emergencies. It means that whim, emotion, are not tools of cognition. They're not how we know about the world. They might be how we know about our internal state, and they're important to tell us about our internal state. But if we really want human beings to be successful, what we need to teach them, what we need to emphasize to them is that they need to think, that they need to use their reason, and how to think. We need to give them the tools on how to do it. It's not self-evident. How to define one's terms, what a, how, to, how, to, how to think conceptually is not easy. It's, it's, it's why we need a robust educational system, why education is the most important industry in the world. It's so important, and I'll say something controversial and leave it there, so important that I don't think the government should be involved in it at all. Too important to leave up to government bureaucrats. I want the marketplace. I want the innovation, the, the competition of a marketplace to be in education not just in making iPhones and making uh, apps, but in actually the most important area, teaching people how to use their minds, ultimately, how to think, not self-evident. Progress is not self-evident. You know, take some simple examples. Uh, if you're going to, uh, if, if you're 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, you're still a hunter-gatherer, Think about, think about even hunting, the amount of thinking that had to go into it to design weapons, design traps, design strategies. You can't run off, chase down a bison, jump on it, bite into it, and then eat it. You can't do that. We're not equipped as human beings to do that. We have to trap it. We have to kill it with weapons. And then we have to skin it. We have to open it up, not with our teeth, but with a tool. And then we, we, we use the fur as clothing. But I, do, does anybody out there know how to turn animal fur into clothing? I don't. No idea. Somebody had to figure that out. Some genius of their time. Thinking is what makes all progress pos possible. But, but, you know, in our personal lives. Think about human relationships. How many times have you messed up with other people because you jumped into bed with them or jumped into a relationship with them without really thinking about it, without really evaluating their character, without really judging them? Thinking needs to be applied to everything one does. How many times have you messed up a friendship because you acted on emotion without really thinking it through, without taking into account all the different possibilities. How many times have you screwed up your career because you didn't think it through, because you didn't plan, because you didn't have a strategy? You don't have to be super smart to have a strategy about your career. You just have to take your life seriously to have a strategy about your career. But when we don't do that, we mess up. Or even about your own health. It requires thinking. 
You know, there are too, way too many obese people in the United States. And most of that is a lack of thinking. Thinking, using your mind, using your mind to, 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 to initiate the will to control how much you eat or to exercise more and to think about what's healthy and what's not healthy. That means having a strategy about your life, having a strategy about eating. But that has to be initiated. Your feelings are not going to tell you. Your feelings are not going to tell you. So when you're fully integrated, when you've got it really down and you've thought about all these things and you completely understand them, then your emotions become integrated with your thoughts. And your emotions then are much more aligned with reality. Even then, you have to be careful because it's hard on the spot to evaluate emotions. Whereas you can look, you can see, you can think, you can get evidence, you can get facts and evaluate. So always think. I mean, one of the great tragedies in America today is the fact that there is a vast number of people who are significantly unhappy. Um, that are depressed, suicidal, suicide rates are very high right now, that are drinking, deaths because of uh, uh, drinking and, and destroying one's liver, I guess, and destroying one's health are way up. Opioid addiction, which is a lot of it is psychological. I mean, some of it has to do with, with the way healthcare is practiced. I'm going to leave that aside, not an expert on that. But, but a lot of it has to do with, with people wanting an escape, Wanting an escape, but drugs are an escape. Drug use generally, to the extent that drug use is popular, the fact that so many people are excited about the legalization of marijuana because they get to use it suggests to me there are a lot of people out there who are, you know, at the very least neurotic, depressed, whatever, and they need an escape because that's what marijuana is. For the most part, it's an escape. So I'm, I'm all for legalizing marijuana, just to be clear. I'm also for legalizing harder drugs because I think that's the way you solve these problems is by legalizing them and bringing them out from under, from the, from the black market. But I'm not celebrating because I get to use them because I don't use them because I don't want to escape reality. Reality is really cool. Reality is really good. Life is really cool and really good. I don't want to dull my brain. My brain is the source of the goodness in my life. I want to sharpen my brain. Now, if you had a drug for that, we could talk. Right? But I, I don't know if you're familiar with this statistic, but there's this statistic out there that says that right now, a white men, uh, lower middle class, between the ages, I think it's between the ages of 35 and 55 or something like that, have a declining life expectancy. For the first time in American history, a group of Americans is actually dying younger than they did a generation ago. And a lot of that is attributed to suicide, uh, heavy drinking, and drug use. I would say it's a symptom of a society that doesn't respect reason, that doesn't respect education, that doesn't respect productiveness, going out and working for a living and having a career and planning out a career. And I know a lot of these people lost their jobs. Go find another one. Change careers in spite of all the regulations and all the controls and the slow economic growth. There's still plenty of opportunities out there in the world. I think that this, you know, uh, tragedy of depression in this country is a consequence of our educational system, of the dulling of the American mind, of, 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 the, of, the, of the destroying of the minds of students, of not teaching them how to think, but more importantly than that, not teaching them the value of thinking. Not teaching them the value of reason. That's the ultimate cause of the opium epidemic, opioid e epidemic, the ultimate cause of, of binge drinking in college, the ultimate cause of the increase in suicide rates among teenagers and among older adults is they haven't been taught what it means to live, what it means to live as a human being. They haven't been taught the value and the importance of using their mind. And they haven't been taught how to do it. They've spent their time in circles emoting to one another. 
All right, I'm going to take a break now, take a breath, calm down, and uh, come back and talk more about the importance of reason and rationality. It's a negative consequence when we don't do it. But also, what kind of political economic environment do we need in order to allow it to flourish? You're listening to Ron Brook on Pure Opelka, and we'll be right back after this Looking break. There. There's a lot of people suffering. There's a lot of people depressed. There's a lot of people who are, who are not happy. Uh, a lot of people who are underemployed. A lot of people who don't have work. I mean, you know, Donald Trump got elected. He didn't get elected because people were feeling good about their lives. He got elected because feeling people were feeling terrible about their lives. But I don't think, I think we need to stop looking to our government to solve these kind of problems. These problems are caused by our educational system. They are caused by a certain mentality that people have accepted, a certain entitlement mentality sitting around waiting for stuff to happen to them, sitting around waiting for jobs to show up, sitting around waiting, uh, demanding that the job be around the corner. I've said this on, on shows many times, but you know, if you're in Southern Ohio and you don't have a job, get in your car and drive to Northeast Arkansas or to Texas, where there are plenty of jobs right now in dynamic economies with a lot of upside, with a high quality of life. What do you need to stay in South Ohio for? So our ancestors didn't stick around Europe to be slaughtered, if, you know, if they, if they were Jews or whatever. They didn't stick around Europe to, to die of starvation if they were Irish during the famine. They got in boats and left. And in those days when you left, you couldn't go back. You'd never see your relatives again, and it took months, and you didn't know where you were going. Now it's easy. Get in a car. Go find a job. Now, it's not that simple because we haven't been taught to think, think that way. We haven't been taught to fail. You know, our, our teachers protect us from failure, shield us from failure. They shield us from thinking. They shield us from really engaging with the world. They don't tell us what actually leads to success in life. You know, we're, we're sent around in high school now. All these kids have to do community service. Community service is not what changes the world. Community service doesn't make you a better person. Community service doesn't help the poor long term. Community service doesn't help you as a human being be a better person. You want to be a better person? Go work for a living. Have, have teenagers work in the summer. Have them do paper routes. Have them actually learn where money comes from, where wealth comes from, and fail them in class once in a while. They need to learn how to fail. But they need to learn that the tool for success is not other people, it's not government, it's not their parents, it's their own mind. At whatever level they can use their mind, at whatever ability they have, we're not all born the same with the same level of intelligence, but whatever your intelligence level is, you can still use it. We all have the capacity to reason. We all have the capacity to think. We all have the capacity to have a career, even if it's at something simple. We can do a good job. We can do a bad job. But if you teach them how to feel pride in their work, if you teach them how to think through their work and, and, and think about their work and, and figure out how to do it better, and, and, and succeed and, and, and set values and, and strive to those values and set goals and achieve goals and achieve greater and greater goals. That, that's how you achieve success and happiness and fulfillment. It's the opposite of, the, of depression and alienation and, uh, you know, and, and, and suicide and drinking and drugs that are so prevalent in the culture we have today. Right? You need to get over it. You are the only person responsible for your life. If you're over 18, nobody else is responsible for your life. You're it. And if your teachers haven't given you the tools, then damn those teachers. If the culture is not, is not giving you the tools, damn that culture. But you know what? You know what? 
it doesn't matter. You're the one who has to live with it. So figure out what the tools you need are. Figure them out. Learn them yourself. Today with the internet, you can learn anything, anything on the internet. Figure it out. Set a goal. Aspire to do something. Aspire to be somebody. And go out there and do it. Live. This is all about just living. Not wasting your life. Get out of bed. Get off the drugs. Stop drinking that alcohol. And go and live. You got only one shot at this. It ain't, you ain't going to get, there's no, uh, what, what would you call it, Groundhog's Day. It's not going to happen Two minutes. to you. One shot. One shot. And it all boils down to take your mind seriously. Don't let your emotions over, it be so overwhelming that you can't think yourself out of whatever predicament you have. And get help. If you really need help, if you really can't do it yourself, then get help. There are people out there who can help you. Unfortunately, I think most of the people out there to help you don't have the tools to really help you, which means to emphasize to you what I've just been saying, the importance of your own mind, the importance of thinking, the importance of reason, the importance of being productive, of having a job. Too much of today's do-gooders and, and psychologists and so on are, are, are focused on, yeah, you're entitled and somebody else needs to help you. All right. One minute. Uh, so uh, that's my uh, self-help segment of the show today. Uh, but I, I, think, I think we want to we wanna now broaden this. We want to now ask the question of, okay, what kind of environment, what kind of culture, what kind of political system, what kind of economic system? would make this easy, would make it, it would still require effort. Thinking is hard. 30. And would make it possible for us as an economy, as a culture, to grow and thrive and be successful, not just as individuals, but as a culture. What kind of political system, what kind of economic system allow people to achieve happiness, to, to, to pursue it and achieve it? All right, we'll do that when we get back. You're listening to Ron Brook on Ten. Pelka. We'll be back right after this Bye. break. You're listening to Pure Opelka on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're heading into our last half an hour, filling in for uh, Mike Opelka. He'll be back tomorrow. And uh, let me just remind you that if you want to ha- listen to more Yaron Brook, uh, the Yaron Brook Show is on the Blaze every Sunday from 2 to 4 East Coast time. It's the success. We talked about what is, uh, you know, what is, uh, at the end, what is good for an individual human being and how an individual human being can be successful and uh, be successful in their life, in their career, in everything. And it, 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 at the end of the day, boils down to using their mind, using their reason, and, and taking their life seriously enough to think it through, to plan, to consider, and not get carried away by whim, by emotion, by, by everything else, right? By, by, by non-cognition, if you will, by other people. How do we create a culture like that? How do we create a society like that? How do we create a, a culture and a society that reinforces that, that supports that, and that really makes that a norm? And, and, and possible and, and really a norm. And uh, I'd say that what we need is, what, what does the human mind need in order to flourish? What do individuals need in order to use their mind? What is the enemy of reason, the enemy of thought, the enemy of rationality, the enemy of truth, the enemy of seeking truth? We talked about seeking truth yesterday. The enemy is force. The enemy is coercion. The enemy is an authority with a gun. The enemy is anybody trying to impose their will or their ideas on you. Force is the enemy of the individual. It's the enemy of happiness. It's the enemy of progress. It's the enemy of success. It's the enemy of thinking, of reason, of rationality. 
So the kind of world we want to live in is a world without force. It's a world without coercion. It's a world without authorities that are there to implement their authority, to force their ideas down your throat. Now, how do you live in a world like that? Because that's tough. There, there, there are bad people out there. There are people who want to kill us. There are people who want to, who want to steal from us. Fewer than one would have expect, right? Fewer in a civilized country than one would expect. But there are people. There are the frauds. There are the criminals. There are terrorists in the, you know, coming over from the more barbaric part of the world who want to kill us, who want to impose their ideas on us, want to impose Sharia law in this case on us, and they want to kill us. So what do we do? You have to defend yourself. And in my view, that is why we institute government. We create a government not to live our life for us, not to give us stuff, not to, you know, intervene in our day-to-day life, not to become an authority over us, not to tell us who to trade and who not to trade with, who to be friends with and not be friends with. We create government to protect us from the initiation of force by bad people, whether they're domestic or whether they're foreign. That's it. That's why we create government. So government is the institution that has the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. They shouldn't be allowed to use force against us. They cannot become the authority over our lives. Shouldn't become. They can become. Unfortunately, they are becoming. They should be there to protect us from people, from bad people, or from mistaken people, or from our own, you know, from, from, from conflicts that we get to with other people. It, it might be innocent conflicts. That's why you have a judiciary system. That's why you can sue people. That's why you have a, you know, you have a whole mechanism. You create whole legal mechanisms to arbitrate disputes that we might have with people. But that's the job of government. That's it. It's to protect my mind. It's to protect me from force. It's to allow me to think, allow me to plan, allow me to strategize so I can live a good life. It's government is there to protect me so I can start a business. Think about today. Today, government is there to regulate and control and, and make it as difficult as possible for me to start a business. How Upside down is that. But no, government is there to protect me so I can start a business. So crooks can't come around and steal my stuff. So when I sign a long-term contract with a supplier or with a customer, there's a legal system that, that allows me to, to, to follow through on that contract and, and penalizes me if I don't. Or if they don't, penalizes them if they don't. Government is there to protect. It's there to create the world in which we can use our minds to our maximum potential and maximum ability. Think about why is it that we had an industrial revolution when we had an industrial revolution? Why was suddenly people, suddenly people became really, really smart? Suddenly people figured out how to build steam engines? How, why, why then? Because for the first time in human history, the human mind had to be liberated, liberated from dogma, primarily religious dogma, liberated from kings and queens and authorities and dictators of various sorts, liberated from a social framework that said you had to conform, liberated in the sense that for the first time in human history, maybe with the exception of Greece, the mind became venerated, reason became venerated. It was called, ultimately, the, 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 the pre-industrial revolution was called the age of reason. Suddenly, suddenly reason was respected, thinking was respected, planning was respected. And then people went out and used their mind to improve life, to build, to create, to make. They applied all the stuff that had been discovered during the scientific revolution, again, a product of reason to the problem of human survival, to the problems of human life, electricity, running water, steam engine, railroads, automobiles, flight, and ultimately computers. But for the first time, they had the freedom to do all that. They weren't worried about the gangs 
murdering them or butchering them. They weren't worried about the church burning them alive at the stake. They weren't worried about offending people. They could speak their mind. And they could produce their mind. This is what the founding fathers gave us. They gave us freedom. Freedom to think and to act on those thoughts. And that's why the 19th century was so productive. That's why the 19th century saw the largest ad advancements in human history, in human well-being. All right, we have to take another last short break, and then we'll be back to wrap it up. If you're listening to Ron Brook, filling in for Michael Pelka, we'll be back after this. <laughs> Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka on the Blaze Radio Network. So like Ayn Rand, I am a huge advocate for capitalism and for freedom and for the government staying out of my life. But I'm, I'm an advocate for those things because I'm an advocate for my own life. Because I want to be able to live the best life that I can live. I, I care about my own happiness and my own success and my own flourishing. I am self-interested. And I understand that the only way for me to be successful in life is to use my mind, to think, to apply thinking. And the only political system that leaves people free to think and, 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 and act on those thoughts is capitalism. That's why I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist because I understand the role of reason in human life. I'm a capitalist because I understand that reason, thinking, Rationality is man's means of surviving and thriving and flourishing. And if I want the government out of my life, and I want, and only when we get the government out of our life can we have, can, can we get people now starting to take reason in, in their mind seriously, because if we get government, for example, the first thing I would want to get government out of, what is the one industry you would want to get government out of tomorrow? Tomorrow, if I had to pick one. If I could abolish one department in the federal government, but it's not just the federal government. The problem is this is primarily regulated by the states and by local government. If I could do one thing, it would be to abolish public education. Abolish it completely. And then encourage private entrepreneurs to enter the space. I mean, we could do tax credits. We could do vouchers, whatever. But get government out of education, break up those evil, evil teacher unions who care more about, much more about the teacher pension than they do about educating our kids. Get education on a private footing so that companies compete for our kids. Companies compete to create and to innovate the best educational product possible. Companies compete to, to, to provide us with information about what works and what doesn't work in education so to, 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 to facilitate and to make possible parents taking control over their kids' education, choosing between schools. That's the number one thing I would do before the EPA, before the, any, any of the regulatory agencies, before lowering taxes, before all of the other stuff. Privatize education. Because education is the key. Because, because teaching kids how to use their mind, and again, more importantly, that using their mind is important, is the most important thing you can do. Now, parents should be doing this already. Now, don't wait for the teachers. But not every parent has the time. Not every parent thinks about these things. That's what teachers are for, to teach kids the importance of using their mind and then how to do it. So, we need freedom in education to support kids, grown-ups, everybody, understanding the role of the human mind in human life. So, we need capitalism. We need freedom. And, and start with education and then dismantle the rest of the federal government and, and the state governments and the local governments and all of the people out there who want to tell me how to live, who want to tell me what to think, who want to tell me what to do. And, 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 and let, me just, let me just go off on, on Donald Trump for a minute. I mean, this guy wants to tell me who I can hire, who I can trade with, 
He now wants to tell me whether I can trade with, with somebody in China or Mexico or Canada. He wants to dictate the terms of me dealing with them. Let me be clear. I'll do a whole show on this. It, it, you know, and if, if, you, if you start listening to my show on Sundays between 2 and 4 East Coast time, you'll hear the show when I do it. But w I have a right to trade with whoever I want. If, I, if that person happens to be a Chinese person, if that person happens to be a Mexican, if that person happens to be a South Korean, why is it any of Donald Trump's business? Why is it any business of our government at all? They're there to protect me, not to impede my freedom, not to impede my ability to go out there and try to make my life better. And if I believe making my life better is by trading with somebody in China, then it's none of their business. Now, if China was an enemy, like, like Iran or North Korea, yeah, I'm all for banning trade with the enemy. But yeah, let's define the enemy. I'm all for that. Not having trade with them. Sure, but there are only like three, four countries in the world that would probably qualify as the enemy of the United States of America. Most of them are not enemies. Mexico is not an enemy. Canada is not an enemy. So, because I value my life, I value trade. Trade is win-win. Trade improves my life. And all the all economists who look at this, and you know, you don't need this economic data because trade is a fundamentally a moral issue. I have a moral right to trade with who I want, and the government should just get out of my way. The only, only, only legitimate trade policy is zero tariffs. Get out of the way. Lower unilaterally. The United States should lower tariffs to zero unilaterally tomorrow. That's the only moral thing to do. And from an economic perspective. It is the only logical thing to do. It will raise 16. the wealth of Americans dramatically. But nobody, nobody talks about that. Everybody, everybody wants to tinker. Everybody wants to control in politics. This is why I never go into politics. Right? Politics is about imposing your will on other people. It's about today being an authority over other people, telling people how to live, telling people who to trade with, telling people how much of their own money they can keep. I don't want to have anything to do with politics. Now, if politics 30. was the way it should be, protecting, then we could talk. All right. So today, we talked about all the good stuff in the world. We talked about the fact that good stuff in the world comes from the human mind. And we talked about capitalism as the only, only political system in human history to protect the human mind. And that's why it's so successful. And that's why, that's why we have 10. all the good stuff out there from better health care to better food. To, Five, to, to better technology. All right, you've listened three, to Ron Brook on the Michael Pelka Show. Goodbye.